Our speaker today is Dr. Stephen Bramer. He is the department chair and professor of Bible exposition. After teaching in Canada for 16 years, Dr. Bramer has taught the last 24 years here at Dallas Seminary as professor of Bible exposition. Since 2009, he has served as the chair of this department. He also currently serves as a teaching pastor at Waterbrook Bible Fellowship in Wiley, Texas, and as a board member for Insight for Living Ministries as well. He leads tours yearly to Israel and teaches most years at the Jordan Evangelical Theological Seminary to young Christian Arabs headed into ministry, as well as teaching e each year at Word of Life Bible School in both Hungary and New York. Stephen and Sharon have been married for 44 years and are the parents of two married daughters, Sarah and Charity, and a married son, Joshua, and the proud grandparents of 10, 10 grandchildren. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Stephen Bramer to our chapel today. Avoid leprosy. Avoid leprosy at all costs. As a student here at DTS, in your ministry, in the scripture in Leviticus 13 and 14, there's a long list of different skin diseases, all called leprosy. And if you get leprosy and it cannot be cured, then you are going to be isolated. You'll be in quarantine, both uh, from society and uh, from any religious activities. Today, leprosy is referred to as Hansen's disease. It's an infection caused by a slow-growing uh, bacteria. It's contagious. You, you get it from mucus uh, uh, secretions or, or from droplet. It affects the skin, mucous membranes, nerves, causing discoloration and lumps in the skin, and in severe cases, disfigurement and deformities. Leprosy today is now mainly in uh, parts of Africa and parts of Asia. If you have leprosy, two or three antibiotics can cure that and prevent it from further damage. Avoid leprosy at all costs. Chaplain Joe always asks us to be practical and to give some advice. I've given it to you. Avoid leprosy. <laughs> now that we've got that done, turn in your Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 26. We're going to take a look at a servant leader. His name is Uzziah. I think it's legitimate to refer to this king as a servant leader because from the very beginning of the monarchy, uh, starting with David down there in Jerusalem, God had referred to him in 2 Samuel 7 as a servant. So tell my servant David. So David is a servant of the Most High, but God gives him a ministry. He said, I've made you ruler. I've made you leader of my people Israel, and I promise to give you descendants. King Uzziah in this passage is one of the descendants of King David. His name is mentioned three times in extra biblical material, all written on stone. Two of them are seals that were discovered back in 1858 and in 1863. Trouble is they've been lost, and so we don't have them anymore. But there's great evidence that this servant leader was successful. He was used by God. He was blessed by God. I take a look there at chapter 26, verse 1. He started young, 16 years of age, at the insistence of the people. He reigned, verse 3, for 52 years. He rebuilt the port city, in verse 2, of Eloth, or Elat reminds you of King Solomon who built that port city so that the people of Judah could go down the Red Sea to Africa and over to the Persian Gulf. He was successful in foreign affairs. Militarily, it says in, in verse 4 and following, that he defeated the Philistines at Gath and Ashdod. He defeated the Arabians and the Munites. He required tribute from the Ammonites. Verse 8, he grew very strong, very strong. 
But not only was he successful in external foreign affairs, he was very successful in the domestic internal affairs. Verse 9, he rebuilt and fortified Jerusalem. David had built Jerusalem. Uh, King Uzziah's father had allowed Jerusalem to be part of the wall to be destroyed, the treasures to be taken away. And here is a servant leader who comes and for the glory of God, no doubt, rebuilds Jerusalem, fortifies it. He develops his extensive land holdings, verse 10. The reason given is he loved the soil. He's a farmer at heart. I, I just relate to that. Land is important in the scripture. And he loved the land that God had given to him. In verse 11, he organized the army. He made military provisions for the army. Over 300,000 fighting men organized under leaders. He developed some of the latest machines invented by skillful men to be on the towers. No red flags. No red flags. This is a wonderful, godly servant leader. If he had written a book about leadership and organization and vision, I would have read it. I would have read it. And why was he so successful? Well, take a look back at verse 4. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. According to all that his father had done, this is referring to the earlier part of King Amaziah. The later part, he did walk away from the Lord. He served the Lord. Uh, verse 5, he set himself to seek God. He, he sought at the end of the verse, the Lord. God made him to prosper. God made him successful. He is blessed by God. Verse 7, and God helped him. Kind of interesting that in Kings, his name is King Azariah, which means God is my help. Uzziah means uh, Yahweh uh, strengthens. So, so he is being helped by God. He's being strengthened by God. Verse 15, his fame spread. He was marvelously helped. Back in verse 7, uh, uh, or verse 8, his fame spread even to the border of Egypt. Now his fame is spreading far. He's marvelously helped. Uh, the implication is he is being helped by God consistently and amazingly. I would have had him speak in chapel. Not only has he written a great book on leadership and, and organization, but he's stayed close to the Lord. And the Lord has been the one who has helped him. Wonderful. Verse 16. But when he was made strong, he grew proud to his destruction. Fame is not wrong. Strength in being used by God is not wrong. I, I trust that you will be blessed by God, that God will use you, that, that you, you may have a ministry that, that goes far. Praise God. The trouble is, is what are you going to do with that fame? What are you going to do with those accomplishments? See, pride is when you begin to take upon yourself the glory that belongs to God alone. You begin to think that you are successful, not because of God, but because of your ability, your education, your success, your organization, your vision. And early on in ministry, we often recognize that, that we are in desperate need of the Lord. We preach and we pray ahead of time. But then we get successful. And, and, and we become accustomed to being used by God. And perhaps then we don't seek him. Look back in verse 5. He set himself to seek God in the days of Zechariah. We don't know anything more about this Zechariah. Who instructed him in the fear of the Lord of God as long as he sought the Lord God made him prosper at some point in time perhaps he felt that he didn't need to be taught that that he had what he needed and he became proud and the evidence of pride in this particular story 
is that he thought that he was above the laws of God. That he was so successful, he was so famous, that he shouldn't be required to be restricted in any way. Happens to preachers all the time, where they begin to read their own press. They begin to see what has been accomplished in their ministry, and then they feel that their authority should be such that they can become spiritually abusive at times. And they can actually take actions to themselves that are against the word of God. Now notice, he began to act unbiblical, but it's not that he worshipped other gods. It's not that he got involved in sexual immorality, although those, those could be evidences of being proud. But notice what happened. He became unfaithful to the Lord God, verse 16, and he entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. He took upon himself a role of responsibility that was restricted to others, to the priests and ultimately to the high priests. But he thought that he should be able to do this. I'm sure he convinced the people around him. He justified it. He rationalized it. Uh, he, he was able to, to hermeneutically twist. He did hermeneutical gymnastics all over the Old Testament till finally what God had said he shouldn't do, he said he should do. And he went into the temple. And God's judgment did not fall upon him when he went into the temple. And God's judgment did not fall upon him when he took that censer. And God's judgment did not fall upon him when he put that incense into the censer to go into the holy place to offer it in the altar of incense. God's judgment fell when he was confronted by godly people who knew the word of God and he didn't repent. See, the high priest and 80 priests walked in and confronted him. These are courageous men. This is the king who has their life in his hand. But they knew the word of God. They were committed to the word of God. And so it didn't matter what the king thought or how he had justified it. They were willing to say, but the word of God says, let me read you the verse. You're not to do this. God is gracious. God is merciful. He gave him a chance to repent. But rather than repenting, take a look at it, he became, verse 19, angry. And he became angry with the priests. He refused to accept any sort of challenge to his authority, any sort of confrontation to his particular um, view and action. I'm sure when he was angry, he was loudly speaking against these priests. How could they do that? And then, perhaps, he realized the priests were beginning to point at him, at his forehead. And maybe put his hand up there, and he realized there are lumps, and there is disfigurement, and my skin and my forehead, it's become leprous. And he hurried out of the temple. He, he knew the story, I'm sure, of Korah back in the Old Testament who took some incense and put it in the censer and he did not last long. And now that the judgment has fallen, he hurries out of the temple. The Lord has struck him. Verse 21. And he was a leper to the days of his death. For the next 10 years, he was excluded from the house of the Lord. He, he lived by himself. And when he died, verse 23, slept with his father, they buried him with his fathers in a burial field that belonged to the kings. And Zepataph was, he's a leper. He's a leper. The third place that Uzziah's name is found in stone is in, on a gravestone, per, perhaps in the second temple period, as Jerusalem grew, they had moved his, his grave out of Jerusalem over probably to the Mount of Olives. That's where this gravestone was found. Written in Aramaic, hither were brought the bones of Uzziah, king of Judah. Do not open. He's a leper. He's a leper. I started off saying, avoid leprosy. I'm really not worried about a skin disease. I'm worried about you starting to believe 
your grades, starting to believe what people say. You feel like you're Babe Ruth and they should write the man, the myth, the legend all about you. Uzziah is the man, the king, the leper. Because if we allow the blessings that God gives to us not to result in giving God glory, turning that honor which is right to give to the person who works hard at preaching and teaching, but taking that honor and giving it to God and rather keeping it for ourselves, we can become proud. And when we become proud, it can give evidence in many, many ways, but one way is that we don't think that the word of God should restrict us in any way that we believe that because of what we think about ourselves or what other people tell us that we can do, that we should be able to do it after all. We're created the image of God and therefore we should honor God in any way we want. And God says, there are certain things I don't want you to do. Certain things I don't want you to do. Let me wrap this up because of time. Beware of the danger of fame and success in ministry. If you forget what who got you there, the Lord and his strength. Pride could cause you to reject the very truth of the word of God. And it's likely that if this happens in your life, God will no longer use you as his servant leader in his ministry. Avoid leprosy. Let's pray. Father, may you find in each one of us a humility that takes what you have given to us in our ministry and offer it back to you in an act of worship. Father, keep us from becoming proud. We desperately want to be used by you. Help us to understand and apply your word this day. I pray in Christ's name.